All right, once again, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm gonna talk about this concept of GitOps patterns today. Um, and I'm also gonna do something a little bit sneaky um, on my way in, and I will hold off on telling you exactly what that is for just a moment. Let me take just a moment. There may be some of you who don't know who I am. I'm Cornelia Davis, I am the CTO here at Weaveworks. Um, a little bit more of my background, I've been doing this for about 30 years. Um, I've been in the industry for about 30 years. I come from a development background, so computer science in school, um, and then in industry, I have been a developer. I did study programming languages, so by full disclosure, you're, you'll hear me maybe get a little bit geeky, and even just a moment ago when we were chatting with Luke about, you know, calculus of, of various things. Um, uh, I have been spending, I've spent probably well over 15 years on the web, um, doing web architectures, uh, have been doing cloud native for nearly a decade, although I will concede that we haven't been calling it cloud native, but you're gonna hear me use the term cloud native throughout the next hour. Um, and uh, uh, we haven't called it that, but we really, it's kind of emerged as, as this, this concept of cloud native. Um, before coming to Weaveworks, which is almost a year ago, I spent uh, seven or more years at Pivotal, um, where I worked on Cloud Foundry, as well as Kubernetes. I've been working in the Kubernetes space for nearly four years, which doesn't make me a newbie. It also doesn't make me a veteran, um, but I, you know, it's got, I get a little bit of a mileage under me for uh, Kubernetes. I'm also the author of a book called Cloud Native Patterns. So as I said, I'm gonna be talking about cloud native. I'm also gonna be talking about patterns and I'll come back to the, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of put the bow on, on the talk at the very end. Um, but what I'm really talking about here in GitOps patterns is cloud native operational patterns. So I'll bring that, I'll circle back to that by the end of the talk as well. Now, this is probably a slide that you've seen maybe more than once even today um, and seen it in various other presentations. And so I'm not gonna define GitOps at this point. Um, we do know that, and in, in you've I'm certainly heard talk about the, the, uh, the four principles of GitOps, you know, declarative configuration and agents that are, you know, making, making it so being what I like to call the bookends and then bringing into that version controlled, um, probably in Git, not always, but probably in Git, um, as well as applying this retry pattern that we just heard Scott talk about to the delivery part of that entire life cycle. Those are really kind of the main things. So it's all about achieving things like re reliability, observability, productivity. And again, we heard Scott talk about those things and we heard Paul talk about those things earlier today when he talked about the business benefits of GitOps. So I won't repeat any of that. What I'm going to do instead is I'm gonna pose this question, which is, okay, if we buy into all of those values of GitOps, then how do we GitOps? And so at a very, very high level, is it this? We're gonna store code in configuration and for GitOps, we tend to focus maybe more on the configuration, although the code is important there as well. We store that in some type of a version controlled, you know, source code management repository or some kind of version controlled immutable store. Then we apply some automation and that automation yields something running in production. And so is that what we do with GitOps? Is it that we start with, you know, we just, as soon as I have Git, as soon as I've got some automation that causes things to happen in a runtime environment, I've got GitOps. Well, yeah, kind of. The answer is that yes, that this is kind of the core pattern. We're gonna talk about GitOps patterns. The core pattern, and oh, by the way, I just noticed that there's a little bit more build which is of course that we've got some UX and we, in, in this case, um, in a purest GitOps sense, we're using Git as the user experience, as the user interface into this entire process. And so again, I pose the question is, is this enough? And the answer is yes, but details matter. And the details that I'm talking about here are um, 
how exactly we do that core pattern, that core pattern of, hey, I've got an Im immutable version store, I've got some automation and I've got a runtime environment. How we do that absolutely impacts the values, the business benefits that we get at, on that. And we believe that doing those things in the right way, achieving those, those benefits requires that we do things in a, in, a, in a very specific way. So I'll admit that I am a, a propeller head. I am a mathematician, computer scientist. I, I love calculus. I love all of those things. And I was just, if, the, if you were with us just a few minutes ago, I was talking about the calculus of other things, calculus other than pure mathematics or computer science. And so if you'll bear with me for the next 20 or 25 minutes or so, I am going to do a derivation. So rather than talking to you about the four principles of GitOps, I am going to try to derive them for you. I'm going to try to prove that those principles are in fact the essential ones that we need to achieve really the GitOps values that we want. And importantly, as we go through that, we're going to find a number of patterns. So again, that first pattern was the one we've talked about. So if we start with kind of this very familiar workflow, we've got a developer and a DevOps engineer. They could be the same individual. They could be a part of a team where we've got developers and DevOps engineers. And what they are doing is they are cutting source code and they are putting that into a Git repository. And then the DevOps engineer is also capturing the application configuration in a Git repository as well. There's a CI process that translates that source code into, well, we're living in a containerized world here. So we're living in the Kubernetes space and I'm gonna assume Kubernetes. GitOps applies to areas other than Kubernetes, but for simplification, let's assume Kubernetes in this, in this uh, um, dialogue, in this derivation. So of course we have the CI process that is gonna translate that source code into a container image. And that container image is gonna be stored again in some type of a store. Now I'm not gonna go into all of the details, but well, I've talked about a versioned immutable store. Does the image repository have to be versioned and immutable? And the answer is maybe. Um, you need that versioning and immutability. And I did a talk at GitOps Days in May that talked more about that particular thing. So I'll invite you to take a look at the, uh, the, the video to see more details on that. But if that's the you know, workflow that we're all familiar with from the developer and DevOps engineers persp perspective, then what we're gonna do is we are gonna, up, again, apply the automation and we're gonna deploy that into Kubernetes. So I, I have hinted at the fact that that automation, the way that we do that automation is really um, important. Now, one of the common ways, if we take a look just at this picture, well, we've already got automation. So that automation that you see in the middle there with the little blue gears, the question is, what does that automation look like? Well, we recognize there's already automation in this diagram and it is that label, it's that CI label. We've already got automation there. So one of the things that we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of experimentation where we're saying, well, that automation that takes this familiar workflow and brings things all the way out into the development environment, into the runtime environment, let's explore whether CI is the right place to do that. I mean, CI, is a mature process. We have been building out those CI practices and quite frankly, CI patterns for more than a decade, probably going on two decades or more. And it allows us, it's achieved all sorts of values for not only the development process, but it definitely has extended left and right just a bit as well. Although I will say that for the most part, it has given us um, gains particularly in this kind of dev life cycle that you see here, this continuous integration life cycle. We have a set of mature technologies that support this basic pattern. And so it's natural to think, well, maybe what we want to do is we want to take that and we want to extend it out into that deployment. And so what I'm talking about is taking those blue gears and pulling those into the CI process. 
But continuous integration is not the same as continuous delivery and deployment. And there are some downsides to doing that. So to review those downsides, and I'm gonna make the assertion that these things should be separate from CI is, and there's more than what I've listed here, is this notion of separation of concerns. In some regulated industries, this is required that developers release, so they've got their life cycle, and operation, operators deploy. And so integrating this into a single workflow really complicates the who can do what, and it, 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 it stands to you know, really muddy up the waters around um, where that separation of concerns is. I know that in those environments, there are auditors that come in to validate the separation of concerns. And if you have a single pipeline or even a single tool with multiple pi pipelines, establishing that separation of concerns from an audit perspective can be more difficult. Of course, you also are going to be doing deployments into many environments. And so do you want to really introduce that complexity of multiple environments into the CI process, or do you want to keep those things separate? Um, along those lines, re recreating a deployment sh shouldn't require a new build. Um, and so we're going to go into some of these details in a little bit more. There's, by the way, there's also some of these security concerns. There's a security concern of, well, if the CI process is deploying into my environments, then I need to seed the credentials for doing those, the credentials for those runtime environments. I need to seed those into the CI process. And that exposes a security vulnerability. It's not at all uncommon for um, uh, hackers to gain entry into a system by attacking the CI process. If they can get into the CI process, they can often get the keys the, to the kingdom and we need to avoid that. And so all of that at a high level is my argument for, well, let's keep deployment separate. And the punchline to that is there's no CI CD. It's not one word. There's absolutely CID, CI and there's CD. So going back to this diagram where we had posed the question of, can we just add that automation to the CI process? We're gonna say, nope, we're not gonna add it to the CI process. Let's now hypothesize that adding this into the CD process is important. So there's another GitOps pattern, which is the separation of CI from CD. That is an important GitOps pattern for some of the reasons that I just de de um, uh, defined. Okay, now I mentioned as one of the benefits of that is that as soon as I pull it out, now this, this knowledge of various environments, dev, staging, prod, is now the domain of the CD process, not the domain of the CI process. So that separation gives us that right away. But now, if I've got a CD process that looks like this, I've got a CD process that is pushing out into all of these different environments, I am going to concede that that question, that, that challenge around security, where I said, well, you've got some centralized thing. It used to be the CI process, but now I've got a centralized CD process, that that CD process, um, centralized CD process now is the security vulnerability because I have to configure my, my credentials for dev, staging, and prod into that CD process. So instead, what we're going to do is apply another GitOps pattern, which is to pull. We spin those things around. And those of you who are familiar with Flux, and I'm not assuming that our entire audience is, but those of you who are familiar with Flux and the Flux approach to doing GitOps is that it is all about the pull model. We put the CD agent into the cluster. And so now the clusters are doing the pull. They need credentials to access the Git repository. We do that with things like deploy keys and, and those types of things. But instead of having a vulnerable hub and spoke, the hub becomes a vulnerability point, we now actually have taken that security concern out. So pull is another important GitOps pattern. But then the question is, 
how do we know when to pull? So if these things are all autonomous, dev staging prod, and as we go out into the edge, we are absolutely um, going to be require that autonomy. How do we know when to pull? Well, the good news is that we don't have to. Now, absolutely, we can use events. And we do do that. And even in Flux, we do use events. So we are watching the events that are happening, for example, in a Kubernetes cluster. We're looking at the API server. We're picking up on those events. And we can trigger off of those events. But one of the fallacies of distributed computing is that we aren't going to lose the network. And that we're, and by, by extension, we're not going to lose um, events. Well, the reality is that events can be lost because the network is not always reliable and events can be lost. So how do we get around that? It isn't purely eventing that solves this problem. It is this. It is the fact that we have reconcilers. And this going back to what Scott said is a retry pattern. This is a retry pattern from the perspective of continuous delivery. So it's an operational retry pattern. And that is another GitOps pattern. All right. So I'm going to simplify the picture a little bit here and say, OK, so we know we have these multiple environments. But this is now the basic pattern. So you can see how we started with the basic premise of Git, automation, and runtime environment. And we've already finessed that a little bit. We've already shown that there's a specific way and we get some benefits from that specific way of doing that automation that ties together the, get, the declarative configuration in the immutable version store and the runtime environment. Now this basic pattern, and we've gone through about three or four so far, and that set of patterns in this basic pattern really enables a bunch of additional interesting uh, GitOps patterns. So let's review some of those. Let's take a look at some of those. The first one that I want to talk about is a pattern around drift detection and remediation. So here we have this environment. We have deployed things into that environment in that you know Kubernetes environment. And somebody comes along and does a kubectl apply. And I like to refer to kubectl apply as the modern day SSH. Um, we have learned in the DevOps community that SSH is a bad thing. And in fact, um, I, I've never been able to confirm it, but there's this, um, you know, this, uh, this lore around the fact that when Adrian Cockcroft first came in and started establishing these new paradigms inside of Netflix, that he said, we are no longer going to allow SSH into environments. And the developers or the operations people, DevOps people, said, oh, but we need SSH. And he said, nope. And they said, but we need SSH. And he said, nope. And but we need SSH. And eventually they figured out how to avoid the SSH. This is what the GitOps represents, is it, it represents a way to avoid the modern day SSH instead of the kubectl apply. And if somebody does a kubectl apply, then that reconciler is going to undo that change. Or you might set up a GitOps pipeline that doesn't immediately undo the change, or perhaps it immediately undoes the change and it sends out an alert. So you get to decide what that GitOps pipeline is. You get to decide what that behavior is. Do you want to immediately revert back or do you want to revert back as a first thing and do a notification? Or are you in an environment where you don't want to revert back, but you want to send an alert? Or you want to issue a PR in a repository that says, OK, I just saw you make this change. Um, is this something you really want? And if so, you need to make sure that you put it in your, into your Git repository, into your declarative configuration. So drift detection and remediation is an important pattern that is, um, that is enabled through this. Now, another one that, again, some of you are familiar with, it, but um, others may not be, is a pattern around image update automation. 
So I've kind of made a little bit more space here again in, in the slide. So I've pushed the, the, the process to the left and we're familiar with what that is in the runtime environment on the right. So again, what we have here is we have a CI process that is updating container images and we have an application configuration that must, must, must be pointing to a specific version of that image, must be pointing to a specific version. A GitOps pattern is, and it's not only a GitOps pattern, but it's just an important pattern, is don't ever have your configuration pointing to latest. If you point to latest, you're never going to be able to achieve reproducibility. So you've got this pattern where you've got application configuration is pointing to a specific version. And that's what we see here. So here's my YAML, and it points to a specific version in that repository. Now, a developer makes some changes to source code. The CI process, all of the unit tests pass. It creates a new container image, and now I've got version two. Now, of course, as a human being, I could go into my application configuration, and I can make the change from version zero to version two, and that's ultimately what we want to do. But what you start to see here is that, in fact, I've got a reconciler that I can use to do that. And that's what we call the image update automation reconciler. Its job is to watch the container image and the container registry. And now I'm going to remind you all of something that Luke talked about when he talked about the ML, ML ops. He talked about parameters being in an S3 bucket somewhere. So what we're doing here is that this reconciler isn't watching Git, it's actually watching another source, which is this image repository, or by extension, a, an S3 bucket that might have parameters or might have, um, you know, might actually, he had, in fact talked about the model being inside of that. So the, the Docker image not having the model embedded, but having the model sourced from an S3 repository, and we need to trigger when that changes. Same basic pattern here that we see. Okay, so we've got that reconciler. And then what we do is we also have a reconciler that says, okay, well, what I'm gonna do there is when that has changed, I'm gonna have a reconciler that does a git push and updates that in the configuration repository. Now I'm using that as a simplified thing. Maybe it issues a PR or maybe in staging it issues a push, but in production it issues a PR you get to decide that as you're building up your GitOps pipelines. So it does the push into the GitHub repository. Now notice that nothing's happened over in the runtime um, system yet. And of course, what we have there is we have yet another reconciler that pulls from that Git repository and then realizes that into production. So what you could see here is a series of reconcilers, each kind of the Linux philosophy, each does one thing and it does one thing well. And then what we're using is GitOps pipelines. And I would assert that GitOps pipelines themselves are a fundamental pattern in the space. That GitOps pipelines, um, uh, you use those to wire together your specific behavior. And this is one of the ways that you can do it. Now let's talk about one final pattern here, and then I'm gonna move into kind of a different area, and that's environment customizations. This one is really very simple, is that remember we've got dev staging and prod, they're all pulling from some, some base configuration, but there are differences. And that's where you're gonna use something like customize. And the idea here is that there's a base configuration, and then what you are storing in your Git repository are overlays, specific things that are gonna be different in each one of those environments. So for example, in development, you don't need to go all the way up to large, large, large you know, numbers of replicas of a particular thing. You definitely want two or more because you want to be able to test the behavior of what happens when one goes away, but probably having two or three is enough. In a staging environment, you may want to max it out. This is your product, this is your, you know, um, um, stress testing environment. I want to see how this is, how my applications are going to behave when I've got 20 instances. 
But right now in prod, I may not need to go up to those 20 instances, I only need 10. So that's another important thing that is enabled and something like the customized controller um, and then embedding that customized controller into your GitOps pipelines is another important pattern. Okay, so I think I've argued, first of all, I argued that deployment should be separate. And now what I've been talking about is I've been talking about this delivery controller space. Now, here's the question though, is that, would you say that that takes us all the way to deployment? I would say not quite yet because mostly I've been talking about delivery and I kind of glossed over the fact that somehow this ends up in the runtime system. And so we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. And so with that, let's look at one more pattern. So we were just here, if you remember, we did this Git pull, remember this image update automation, we had these different reconcilers and we had this GitOps pipeline. Technically, that isn't actually resulting in things going all the way into a runtime state. What this does technically is it just pulls things into etcd. Now, once things are in etcd, we have a number, we need to actually get these things running as pods, containers inside of pods in the runtime environment. How do we do that? Well, there's reconcilers right? That's the thing that was popularized by Kubernetes is that we have these reconcilers. Now, Kubernetes has a deployment strategy built into it. You can, if you've never watched it, it's the first time I watched uh, Kubernetes do it, it was super cool. So, so long as you're not doing kubectl runs, you're doing kubectl applies, um, Kubernetes will say, ah, okay, well, I'll do a rolling upgrade on this. But the rolling upgrade strategy is pretty simple. What if you want to do something a little bit more sophisticated? What if you don't want to just embrace the, um, the Kubernetes native way of doing deployments, but you want to do something like a blue-green deployment, you want to do canary style where you can pull back, um, all of those different things. So how do I do this? Well, you guessed it. The way that we're going to do that it allows some of these other uh, um, deployment strategies is we are going to introduce a reconciler. Now that reconciler, I'll, I'll talk about these reconcilers. These reconcilers are not what I would call delivery controllers. These are what I would call runtime controllers. And I can't help but talking about one of my favorite projects, open source projects, and that is Flagger. Flagger allows you, and it builds in, it essentially builds that those retry loops, that reconciler, that is going to support a number of different types of release strategies and things like Canaries A-B testing, blue-green deployment. So here again is another key GitOps pattern of it's not only the delivery controllers, it's also the runtime controllers. And stitching those things together is what in fact gives us all of the GitOps. So whew, I know that's a lot. And this picture right here is really complicated. So let me circle back and try to simplify it a little bit. And so what we're talking about here is we are talking about configuration that's sitting in a Git repository. We're talking about delivery controllers that will bring things into, and again, I'm kind of constraining the space here, into Kubernetes. So they bring it into etcd. Then we have a series of runtime controllers that actually affect those things coming in production. This looks pretty darn familiar, does it not? I started at the very beginning with, is GitOps storing code and configuration with automation and achieving that into in the runtime environment? And I said, yes, it is, but we're gonna do it in a very special way. And that's what makes it GitOps. This is really what the punchline is. Oh, and I forgot the UX part as well, again. So GitOps is really about this. It's about these delivery controllers, 
the runtime controllers, stitching all those things together in pipelines. And I'm not in fact showing it in this diagram, but it forms a closed loop all the way back into the, the uh, version, immutable version state that is in GitOps. So I really, if you will, should be showing Git on the far left and the runtime environment on the right. But this is what you know GitOps does. Now you heard me use the term GitOps runtime. And this is what I like to call not just the GitOps concept, but the GitOps runtime. And it's important that we start to build out this runtime. And tomorrow, I'll give you a little foreshadowing. I'm going to talk a little bit about this concept of the GitOps platform that extends this notion of a GitOps runtime. So if we come all the way back to this picture, you can see that I've stitched together delivery controllers and runtime controllers. And that, in combination, is what we call GitOps. So yes, GitOps is that basic pattern that I started with, but there's a whole lot of other patterns to come into that. So in closing, we've got GitOps really is delivery and runtime and operations. And what I hope I've done, if you will, is that I have um, derived, if you will, the four principles of GitOps rather than just asserting them Hopefully, at this point, you're thinking, ah, I can see how those different patterns really are exemplified in these principles that we have. And my final slide here is just a review of some of the patterns that we have gone. I'm not going to go through them again, but there's actually more here than I talked about more patterns than are even listed on this slide. But I want to come back to this punchline may seem a little self-serving, but I'm going to bring back the title of my book. I didn't call it out before, but the subtitle of my book was Designing Change Tolerant Software. What we're really talking about when we're talking about GitOps is cloud-native operational patterns. And what we're aiming to do is design and operate highly distributed and change-tolerant software. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I am going to stop sharing my screen now.